0820 Allied time in near darkness and heavy mist, 1386 field and 684 heavy pieces of 4th British Army's artillery opened fire from between just north of the Somme and 14 miles east northeast of the key town and transport node of Amiens to 11 miles south west. If you look at the map, it's the blue dotted line. To the south of this, the artillery of 1st French Army also opened fire. The Battle of Amiens, the first planned large scale Allied offensive of 1918, the start of the Hundred Days and a decisive defeat for the German army had begun. Three minutes later, the rolling barrage, the British Mark V tanks, and not far behind them, the infantry, began to advance to the first objective, the Green Line. The German Second Army had held the front in this area since the German offensive had stalled in early April. And this was within artillery range of Amiens and the key Amiens-Paris railway. The German defences considered poorly wired trenches with little depth, but its strength was the determined machine gun teams in the high corn and shell holes, and as we will see, some artillery. The ground they were defending is open rolling countryside with a few large villages and woods. Just north of the Somme, at the top of your map, a narrow east-west ridge line dominates the ground to the north and the south. South of that, the Santerre Plateau runs west to east across between the Somme and the Avre River and is broken by the River Luce, which runs southwest and northwest across its southern half, uh, by small valleys and ravines running north and south to the Somme and the Arve. Two main and former Roman roads run across the Santerre, and the southern one was the boundary between 4th and 1st French Army. Now, the plan was for an advance in three phases to the Green, the red and the blue line, with, unlike at Cambrai, proper echeloning of formations from phase to phase. The blue line was just east of the old French outer Amiens defence line, and its recapture ensured that Amiens and the key railway were freed from artillery fire. Fourth Army's three corps had 11 divisions compared to six at Cambrai, and a proportionally wider frontage. The main advance was to be done by the elite volunteer Australian and Canadian corps, each with four divisions. North of the Somme, the weak and tired three divisions of 3rd British Corps only had to advance to the Red Line, but the ground that they were supposed to be, take was dominated a key part of the advance to the south. Due to a shortage of suitable tanks, First French Army would only advance after an artillery bombardment from zero to zero plus 45 minutes, which left the Canadian Corps to their north potentially exposed. Now, the advance of the three corps was also supported by 324 Mark Vs and 96 medium A Whippet tanks, 16 Austin armored cars, and 142 supply tanks and gun carriers. The new Mark V tanks were faster, over four miles an hour maximum speed, and more maneuverable. The driver could turn the tank quickly on his own than the Mark IVs, which had been used successfully at Cambrai. They also had the considerable firepower of their predecessors, two six-pounder guns and three machine guns for a male tank, and five machine guns on a female tank. The new Whippets had three machine guns and a maximum speed of over eight miles an hour. Now, the nine Mark V heavy tank battalions, each with 36 to 42 tanks, were allocated as follows. In the north, 10th Tank Battalion to three corps. In the center, 5th Tank Brigade with 2nd, 8th, 13th, 15th and 17th Armoured Car Battalion to the Australian Corps. And in the south, 4th Tank Brigade with 1st, 4th, 
5th and 14th tank battalions to the Canadian Corps. And I'm going to look in a little bit more detail at 10th, 2nd, 17th Armoured Car, 5th and 1st Battalions to illustrate what the Tank Corps did during the battle. And there'll be a guest appearance from a tank of 6th Battalion. 3rd Tank Brigade had 96 whippets in 3rd and 6th Tank Battalions. They were to exploit with the cavalry and beyond the final objective, the blue line, as would the 1st and the 15th Tank Battalion. These had just received the new Langton Mark V Star Tanks, which would carry three machine gun teams in addition to the crew. These tanks would penetrate the enemy's defensive system and form a chain of machine gun posts to the Blue Line. Now, north of the Somme, 3rd British Corps and 10th Tank Battalion faced multiple challenges. Three Corps had only just arrived and taken over from the Australians. It's the three divisions that were going to take part in the battle, 12th, 18th and 58th, were convalescent divisions, which had all suffered severely during the March retreat. 58th Division had lost a further 3,580 men at the Battle of Billy Britain. The initial advance was by 18th Division in the north, just south of Monocourt, on the along the axis of the dominant east-west ridgeline, and the Amiens-Bray Road, which ran along the same ridge. And 58th Division, which was advancing east as far south as the River Somme. The advance was limited to two phases as far as the Red Line. The aim was to capture the high ground along the ridge line, including the sheepy spur, look right in bottom of your map, which dominated the ground south of the Somme. The failure to capture this spur on the 8th of August will result in casualties to the Australians and 8th Tank Battalion from German artillery on the spur. 18th Division faced two major problems with the ground over which it was going to advance. The ridge line itself rises to a high area marked on the map by the hatched area and culminating just to the east of it. The Australians had taken the hatched area just before Three Corps took over, but in response, the elite German 27th Württemberg Division had, a, had arrived to firmly hold the highest point on the ridge just east of the hatched area. In addition, as 18th Division advanced east, it had an open flank to its left, north, which it would have to cover. To its south, 58th Division's advance was hampered by a series of small valleys running south from the ridgeline to the Somme. At 0425 on the 6th of August, two days before the battle started, 27th Württemberg Division attacked, retook the hatched area and took prisoners who did not give away the impending offensive. But the Germans now expected a counter counterattack, of course. And therefore, unlike further south, the attack on the 8th of August did not come as a complete surprise to them. Due to heavy losses on the 6th of August, 54th Brigade of 18th Division was replaced in the attack by 36th Brigade from 12th Division, another division, which had little time to prepare. 10th Tank Battalion was in some ways an odd choice for what was obviously a difficult task. It had not been at Cambrai, and its first action was the March retreat. Having suffered fewer casualties than other units, it was left in the line and only began conversion to the new Mark V tanks in July, and only received its 42 Mark Vs in mid-July. Now this may explain why it only went into action with 30 tanks, six tanks having broken down. In addition, due to the short notice, there doesn't appear to have been any training with the infantry. 18th Division advanced with two brigades, 55th Brigade in the north and 36th Brigade in the south. The latter suffered heavy casualties when it was marching in, and as we've seen, it had had little time to prepare. They were supported in the thick mist by B Company, 10th Battalion, astride the Corby Bray Road, and by A Company, 
to its south. B Company's six remaining tanks, two had broken down, suppressed machine guns and moved on to the first objective. Nearby and in the mist, 7th Queens of 55th Brigade became involved in a severe fight with two German battalions who came forward from the high ground with hand grenades in the mist. 7th Queen's CO, Lieutenant Colonel Bushell, VC DSO, who had not long recovered from his 23rd of March wounds, the day he won his VC, came forward and to quote the divisional history, inspired his men to a successful supreme effort. He directed one tank which was killed by a sniper moving across open ground to task another. Meanwhile, to their south, A Company, 10th Tank Battalions, Commander Major Frederick Andrew Robinson, MC, came forward on foot and under shell fire rallied infantry and tanks that had lost direction in the mist and took them forward to the final objective. He received a bar to his MC for, I quote, his great coolness and courage. However, the depleted 53rd Brigade could not hold the final objective and south of them, 58th Division only reached the first objective. The British official history comments that, I quote, with well-trained troops and more experienced company leaders, the main three corps attack should have gained complete success. And it also criticized the tanks. However, both had suffered heavy casualties during the attack. For example, 7th Queen lost 250 casualties and only 17 out of the 30 tanks rallied. As we've seen, 3 Corps and 10th Tank Battalion faced almost overwhelming challenges and in my view simply shouldn't have been given the task. As the British Infantry and 10th Tank Battalion would prove later on in the 100 days, they were quite capable of taking on extremely demanding tasks if properly tasked. Next slide. Now, just to the south of this, three corps, uh, just to the south of three corps, the elite volunteer Australian corps was to advance between the Somme in the north and the Amiens Chaulne Railway in the south, with third and second Australian division in the north and south, respectively, until the Green Line. If you look at your map, it's about halfway across the map on there. And then fourth and fifth Australian division would take over the advance until the red line, look right-hand side of the map, left of the blue line on there. The ground over there which they are going to advance is open rolling countryside with a few large villages, woods, and narrow and often steep north-south valleys, including critically the Morcourt Valley, which runs south to Harbonnier. Look at the map, right-hand side, above the marker for the red line, the Morkor Valley, and south of that is the largest village of Harbonnier. A former Roman road runs across the Santerre Plateau from Ville Bretonne on the left-hand centre of the map, through east, through Valfusy, and north of Bayonville. The Australian Corps was supported by 5th Tank Brigade, which had allocated 2nd Tank Battalion reinforced by A Company 13th Tank Battalion to support 2nd and later 5th Australian Division. I'm going to look in a bit more detail at their advance. The 48 medium A Whippet tanks of 6th Tank Battalion and 16 Austin Armoured Cars of 17th Tank Battalion were also advancing behind the initial advance and were ready to exploit forward to and past the final objective, the blue line, right-hand side of your map. In the south of the Australian Corps' advance, 2nd Australian Division faced an understrength German 41st Division. Now, as we've seen, the defences were fairly weak, but did include determined machine gun teams and artillery around the centre left of the map left west of the Green Line. And importantly for our story, five batteries of German artillery just north, west and southwest of Bayonville, which is in the centre of the map, 1.5 millimetres uh, miles 
east, southeast of Wachwissing. Uh, this German map shows the five batteries, look for the dotted circle, which were 6th Soak 58th Battery, just northwest of Bayonvilliers, and it was in front of three other batteries, and then importantly for our story, southwest of Bayonvilliers, 6 stroke 27 battery. Now the initial advance to the Green Line was very successful despite the mist, but came down just after the initial advance. Most of 41st Division's infantry was overrun, and by 0710, the Australian Division and 2nd Tank Battalion were in Vafusi and on the Green Line, which is marked on your map uh, about halfway across on that. B and C companies, which were the leading tank companies, lost only three tanks, and those were lost to mines, and the advance now paused as planned until 0820. At 0715, B Company was joined at its rallying point, and the cover just northeast of Buffizi by its CO, Lieutenant Colonel Bryce, his reconnaissance officer, his RSM, and three orderlies. His group was carrying the battalion flag and one of three flags presented by Molash, the Australian Corps commander, to Bryce, the Australian Infantry, and 17th Armoured Car Battalion in order to see who could place their flag first in Harbonneau. Harbonneau is two miles east-southeast of Bayonville and was a key objective because there was thought to be a German divisional headquarters there and it was a potential choke point for the advance. Now, Bryce's decision to take up himself Molinasio's challenge was not just because he was very brave, he already had two DSOs and would receive a third for this action, and eccentric, his battalion had a picnic after rallying on the 20th of November 1917, the first day of the Battle of Cambrai, and to be fair, a very successful day for his battalion but also because there was no effective means of rapid communication between tanks in the First World War. And therefore Bryce, his company, and most of his section commanders had to operate on either foot or horseback. Bryce left his capable second in command, Major Lasky MC, to liaise with 2nd and 5th Australian Division while he went forward. The second phase, the advance to the Red Line, started at 8.20. Due to the range, there was no rolling barrage, only a barrages on the villages starting with Bayonvilliers at 8.20 to 8.50. On time at 8.50, Bryce saw Pape's 11 tanks of A Company 13th Tank Battalion advance east from just east of Vafuzi on a frontage of just over 2,000 yards between just north of the Roman road, top of your map, to level with Bayonvilliers, the two leading battalions of 8th Australian Brigade, 200 yards behind, with three B Company tanks. South of them, six tanks were moving northeast and east to take Bayonvilliers, and south of them, between Bayonvilliers and a mile to the south, the railway line, the nine other C Company tanks and 15th Australian Brigade moving eastwards. As an aside, David, your relative second Lieutenant Tattersfield was commanding a tank in C Company, tank num num number 9004. Behind them was B Company, 6th Tank Battalion's whippets and the cavalry ready to exploit to the final objective, the blue line. The Allied Phase 1 barrage lifted at 8.20, from 400 yards east of the Green Line. With Vice Sergeant Rees, the commander of the German 6-stroke 58 battery, ordered his two remaining guns out of concealment into direct fire positions over open sight. This slide gives you a feel for their view at 8.20. If you look on the horizon, you'll see the church spire of Vaxusi, half right, 
And then if you go right of that, you'll see a black blob, which is a vehicle moving on the Roman road, which disappears off to the right. Almost immediately after 8.20, the two gun crews would have seen up to 11 tanks of A Company, 13th Tank Battalion, in line between the tanks, intrepid Australian scouts, and 200 yards behind them, the main body off on the right and partially off picture, 30th Australian Infantry Battalion, and on the left to our front, 31st Battalion. Each battalion was advancing with two companies in front in two lines of section file, from Wachmuse east towards the German gunners and ourselves. The German gunners immediately engaged the infantry using time shells, forcing them to temporarily take cover. The six Southern A Company 13th Tank Battalion tanks were knocked out in a line. Some of the surviving crews dismounted with their machine guns and began engaging the tanks. Now the German gunners would also have heard the sound of firing toward the southwest at the other side of Bayonvilliers. Six Mark V tanks and Australian infantry were moving east towards Bayonvilliers with a whippet tank called Musical Box behind them. Its commander, 2nd Lieutenant Arnold, saw two Mark Vs knocked out and the Australian infantry come under heavy fire from a German four-gun battery, probably 6th Battery Field Regiment 27, which was just southwest of Bayonvilliers. And if you look at your map, it's bottom right of the map below the B of Bayonvilliers. The faster eight mile an hour musical box was able to turn northeast at 600 yards away from the battery, avoid the eight rounds fired at it. Arnold described seeing the flash of the guns as they fired at him, reached a tree lined road, probably the road or track going west out of Bayonvilliers, turned east until level with the battery and then turn full right south and engage the battery from the rear. To quote Arnold, on observing our appearance from the belt of trees, the gunners, some 30 in numbers, abandoned their guns and tried to get away. Gunner Ribbons and I accounted for the whole lot." End of quote. After inflicting further heavy casualties on the Germans, musical box was knocked out and its crew captured. Three C Company tanks, entered Bayonvilliers, which was cleared. Now, unlike at Fleckier during the Battle of Cambrai, the German guns did not stop the advance for the day. The surviving tanks pressed on with the Australian infantry to reach the red line at about 10.20 as planned. Bryce and his party reached Harbonnier before anybody else and put their flags up, and Bryce was awarded a second bar to his DSO. As the five surviving A Company 13th Tank Battalion tanks and the Australian infantry were moving east toward the red line, the 16 armoured cars of 17th Armoured Car Battalion drove straight past them on the Roman road, through the last effective German resistance and into the German administrative area and, quote, I am quoting, enjoying a glorious hour creating chaos, and I'm quoting the normally incredibly unemotional British official history, wreaked havoc. Now, this was all the more remarkable because the battalion had been formed in haste in 1918. The armored cars were about to rejoin in Iraq the rest of 40 armoured cars that originally been intended for Russia. They did have a maximum speed of 45 miles an hour, but the chassis were overloaded and there were persistent problems with the rear axles. And despite having double tires on the axles, their cross country capability was limited. They had two small tummies with machine guns on them, one machine gun per turret. Now uh, the Battle of Amiens, was to be their first major operation. It had been carefully planned. For example, three Mark V tanks carrying bridges were attached to them 
to help them clear any obstacles, including trees on the Roman road. Once into the German administrative area as planned, six armored cars turned north to Preuer, look top right of your map, found German troops at dinner in billets and completely clear the town. Four armored cars continued along the Roman road and the remainder turned south. A section of two armored cars under Lieutenant Rollins entered Framerville, bottom right of your map. They met a procession of transport wagons moving quietly from Framerville northwards, which they engaged, and who were as surprised as the Germans who came out of the houses in the village to find out what on earth was going on. While the other armored cars wreaked havoc, Lieutenant Rollins was looking for a corps headquarters. At the eastern edge of the village, he found a house of some importance. He went up the steps, revolver in hand, stuffed staff papers into stand bags, and came out to find his gunners facing four German officers who were shot, quote unquote, forthwith, and their papers taken. Critically, these papers included detailed plans of the Hindenburg Line, which were used to penetrate with success the Hindenburg Line at the end of September. And this story was picked up in 1931 by the Daily Express, who asked, where is the subaltern who ended the war? Rollins was tracked down and given £5,000, a very considerable sum at the time, as a reward. He had returned to the police in Glamorgan and ended his career as the acting chief constable in 1943. I'm now going to quote from the Marquis of Anglesey's excellent history of the English cavalry, to be precise, volume eight. It is interesting to consider whether, had they been more numerous and had they possessed wide pneumatic tires and lower reduction gears, they might not have been able, under modern fire conditions, to perform nearly all the functions of the cavalry. Now, we're now going to go to the Canadian Corps area in the south. And to be precise, we're going to look at 3rd Division, which had a difficult operation in the south because it's advanced between 1st Canadian Division in the north and the French, just the other side of the Roman road, which was an obvious axis of advance, was dominated by the high ground the other side of the River Luce, including some large woods such as Dodo and Hammond Wood. A successful advance required the crossing of the Luce which was in the north, as we're about to see, difficult of access, and further south required moving out of an exposed bridgehead and moving across the, an army and international boundary. This boundary created a further problem, a potentially exposed right southern flank, because due to the lack of suitable tanks, the French would not advance until 45 minutes after the Canadians, after a 45 minute preparatory bombardment. Now, to assist 3rd Canadian Division, the Canadian Corps commander, Curry, had given them a narrower front, more artillery, and limited its task to one uh, to two phases. 4th Canadian Division would take over the advance from the red line to the final objective, the blue line. Now, this allowed 3rd Division to use two brigades and the whole of 5th Tank Battalion for the difficult initial advance from the front line to the green line. In order to ensure surprise, 3rd Canadian Division only took its sector over from a Canadian brigade at 0200 on the 8th of August, but did not complete taking up position until 0400, only 20 minutes before the attack went in. And by that time, a thick ground mist had began to form in the valleys, blotting out visibility even after the sun had risen. In the south of the Th 3rd Division's area, 9th Canadian Brigade, supported by A and B companies of 5th Tank Battalion, had a difficult task. And the difficulty of this operation for the tanks and their success is reflected by the MCs awarded to their company commanders. But we're going to go south to look at more detail at C Company, 5th Tank Battalion, and two battalions of 8th Canadian Brigade. They were deployed on a 1200 yard front, look left of your map, north of the loose, 
and just west of Angar village. They had a difficult task, first to capture Angar village, then to advance on a narrow front a mile east, then turn south across the river Luce and cross Demois, and then turn east and go up onto the Santerre plateau to reach the Green Line and further east of Red Line. Eight tanks were allocated for the advance of the Green Line and six from there to the Red Line. It was known that the bridge at Demois had been prepared for demolition by the Germans and the following steps were taken in case anything happened. Two tanks under 2nd Lieutenant Baylis and Fawcett had been fitted with cribs, portable bridging devices. They were manned by picked crews, including the best drivers available, and ordered to proceed to Demware by the quickest route and only to fight such of the enemy as might be encountered on the way. A barrage of shrapnel was to be maintained on the bridge from zero until the tanks were due to pass. A sapper of 3rd Canadian Division was to travel in one of the crib carrying tanks in order to deal with the demolition charges in case the Germans had not blown the bridge. The six second phase tanks of C Company were to follow up at about 500 yards distance. These tanks were to proceed as far as Cemetery Copse, the small wood northeast of Ogar, and on, marked on your map, top of the map, top center, and there await a message as to whether the bridge was passable or not. If the, it was passable, then they were to push on as quickly as possible, cross the bridge and advance the green line with the other tanks. If the bridge was impassable, all the tanks were returned at best speed, cross at Dom out off left of your map and endeavor to overtake the infantry in time for the advance from the green line to the red line. The attack was a success. First Canadian mounted rifles, which were in fact on, on foot, and the leading tanks cleared Angar despite thick mist and moved on Demois. The bridge had been blown despite having been kept under shrapnel fire until the last minute, but the tanks used a crib to cross, and by 0630, the infantry and the tanks, including the second echelon of six tanks, had crossed. By 11 o'clock, the Canadian engineers had repaired the bridge. Only one tank was knocked out and the infantry casualties were very slight. OCC Company, 5th Tank Battalion, Major Gatehouse, was awarded a bar to his MC for, amongst other achievements, follow up closely behind his tanks as they proceeded into action under heavy artillery and machine gun fire, supervising their movements in the clearing of Angar and Dimois. And during this period, he was knocked down by a shell which exploded close behind him. He remained in the tank corps to command 4 Armoured Brigade in the desert and 10th Armoured Division at El Alame. He was then sidelined into an admin job in the USA and was MA in Russia from 1944 to 1947 before he retired. To the south of Gatehouse's tanks, A Company of 5th Tank Battalion successfully rushed over the bridge on the Roman road over the River Luce near Domart. 2nd, 1st and 3rd Canadian, supported by 4th, 5th and 14th tank battalions, pressed on to the Green Line and the Red Line. The Canadian Corps Commander Curry had not left to just the cavalry, whippets and Mark V star tanks, the final advance the Blue Line. While on the northern half of the Canadian Front, 1st and 2nd Canadian Division pressed on successfully to the Blue Line, South of them, the advance of 4th Canadian Division and 1st Tank Battalion through the Red Line was delayed to 1240, leaving them with a four mile advance to the Blue Line without any artillery support. The delay and the distance gave the Germans time to react and reorganize as their successful resistance against the cavalry and whippets in Book or Wood show. The 36 1st Tank Battalion Mark V Stars led the advance. Each tank was carrying an addition to the crew, an infantry officer, a scout and three machine gun detachments. In the northern half of the 4th Canadian Division's area, B and C Company 1st Tank Battalion largely successfully advanced to or near the Blue Line. Meanwhile, 
Major Bouchon, the 1st Tank Battalion Padre, and Lieutenant Mitchell, MC, were waiting 1st Battalion's rallying point for the return of A Company's tanks. Only one tank, covered in bullet marks, returned at twilight with a semi-asphyxiated crew. Now, Mitchell was probably with the Padre, who was awarded an MC for his actions that day, because his tank had knocked out a German tank in the first tank-to-tank -tank action on the 24th of April, 1918. At dawn the next day, the 9th of August, the Padre and Mitchell went forward to find out find what had happened to the missing tanks and the four section leaders. They first met two men carrying a stretcher with the body of Captain Brown, MC and Barr, one of the section commanders. Brown had been Mitchell's section commander on the 24th of April, the day in which Brown had been awarded his second MC. Mitchell considered him to the bravest man he'd ever known. And he remembered how a few months earlier, Brown had asked him to accompany him through gas drenched wood to an infantry brigade headquarters and had said to him, I asked you to come with me because I'm afraid to go alone. I hate war like poison. Some people seem to revel in it, but every time I go into action, I want to turn around and run away. I'm really a coward, but it's no use. We've got to go through to the end. Now as Mitchell and the Padre reached the open ground between Boku top left of your map, and Le Canel, bottom right. They saw the knocked out tanks. They'd been hit by a German battery, dug in and hidden in the wheat, not far from what's now the Canadian memorial to the battle, just west of Le Canel. To quote Mitchell again, one after another, the shells tore through their walls. The loose tins of petrol inside flared up immediately, and the packed cargoes of humanity were either burnt alive or shot mercilessly as they tried to escape through the Swanson doors." End of quote. A Captain Grove MC and Lieutenant Oldham managed to drag out with them a man who was on fire just before the tank, their tank burst into flames. Under heavy machine gun fire, Grove was killed trying to get the fire out on the soldier. Oldham only survived because the Canadian infantry were close behind. Mitchell found the body and another section commander described by him as the perfect little gentleman, Captain Keogh, MC and Barr. Brown and the five other tank corps commanders who died that day, the soldiers who died that day, are buried only a few hundred yards away in a beautiful little Commonwealth War Grave Cemetery on the edge of Bukul village, and I commend it to you. Now Mitchell's story is not quite finished. Mitchell had found what he thought were the remains of a friend of his, and they were buried. A year afterwards, when the war was over, Mitchell attended a battalion reunion dinner in London. A friend came up to me, smiling, and said, I've got someone over here who wants to see you. He says he's got the count to settle with you. I walked over and a familiar voice said, I've got a bone to pick with you. You buried me. What are you going to do about it? Mitchell stared in amazement. There, standing in front of him, in the flesh, was the friend whose remains he'd found. To quote Mitchell, he roared with laughter and told me what had happened. When the tank was hit, he was wounded. He lost consciousness, but he managed to reach the door and pull himself out. As he did so, a German helmet appeared in a doorway and the cold muzzle of a revolver was thrust against his temple. He fainted away and remembered no more until he woke up the next day in a German field dressing station. Now, a tank corps report on tank corps operations on the 8th of August concluded, I quote, it is of special interest to the tank corps that all infantry commanders agreed that their losses were amazingly light and that German prisoners for the first time admitted that shooting of tanks was very good. The great success was one at no light cost to tanks of which a hundred had put out of action, most of them temporarily, mainly by German guns from Le Quenel, which we just looked at, from the neighborhood of Barionvilliers, which was 2nd Tank Battalion, and across the Somme from the Chippy Spur, which was the 10th Tank Battalion. Now, the Battle of Amiens started the 100 days to Allied victory. 
The Germans lost 27,000 casualties on the 8th of August, twice the number of casualties suffered by 4th Army. The Tank Corps had 109, 26% of their 421 tanks knocked out and about 17% personnel casualties on the 8th of August. That compares to about 17% of tanks as knocked out on the first day of the Battle of Combray. Now the proportionally heavier losses of 1st Tank Battalion near Nukenel, 2nd Tank Battalion near Bayonvilliers, and 8th Tank Battalion from the Sheepy Spur were, as in the case of a flick here ridge from Combray, caused by the separation of artillery, tanks, and infantry, combined with the unsuppressed, well-sighted, determined, and trained German artillery batteries. Musical boxes, elimination of a German four-gun battery, and the chaos that 16th, the 16th armored cars of 17th armored car battalion caused demonstrated the importance of speed and the potential havoc that a rapidly moving armored force could deliver and would deliver in the Second World War. Thank you very much. And any questions? Jeffrey, thanks very much indeed for that superb presentation. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, if you'd like to show your appreciation in the usual way, which as we all know is the virtual uh, round of applause via the uh, raising of hands, that would be much appreciated. And, and Jeffrey, I can confirm that there's uh, an awful lot of uh, virtual hands being raised at the bottom of my screen here to, to, to signify how much everybody enjoyed that. Uh, so um, very many thanks for that. Uh, so folks, uh, it's uh, Q&A time now. So if uh, I know we've got a number of questions in already. Right, here we go. Let's um, find Peter Newman. Okay. Um, if I recall correctly, because I've written it down somewhere, but I can't now find it. Um, I was asking about the, the German maps you showed um, about midway, um, showing the location of the batteries um, in Warfusse and the other village, whose name escapes me. And I just wanted to know whether those batteries were actually captured um, on, on that day or whether they, the guns managed to escape. Right, uh, a, a good question. Uh, can I commend to you Bose's The Catastrophe of the 8th of August, which is where the map comes from. There's been an excellent republication um, of it with a translation in English and <clears throat> all the stuff about what 2nd Battalion and what happened to 2nd Battalion and those batteries comes out of that. And I'm very grateful to David Pearson, who's one of the translators for his help in all that. The, uh, in answer to your question, uh, 6058 uh, battery, the guns are overrun and the gun crews, some of them get away through Bayonvilliers. One of the batteries uh, in the rear of the three rear batteries actually fights its way back, losing one gun on the way. The six stroke 27th battery south of Bayonvilliers is knocked out by musical box. That's his description of killing all the tank crewmen. And I did quote what yeah. he said uh, on there. Uh, so to answer your question, most of those batteries are overrun with probably one exception, which was one of the three batteries behind uh, six stroke 58 on there. And remember, these are not full strength batteries by this stage in the German army. They often have uh, down to Two or two to four guns on there. And that includes the batteries in Morfusse, does it? Yeah, it includes all the batteries that I talked about, all five of them. The batteries yeah. in front of Vafuse had already been knocked out. Basically, what happens is the initial phase of the attack overwhelms completely the Germans. Uh, for either uh, the infantry of 41st Division is either put in the bag taken prisoner or knocked out. Very few get away. And most of the artillery forward of Vafuse, i.e. anything that's to the left, to the west of that, were knocked out or captured during the advance. Thank you. Excellent. Thanks for that. Thanks for your question there, Peter. 
Right, okay, so um, next is Michael, uh, Michael Werner. The armored cars that made their, their way to the rear of the Germans, uh, were they towed across the front trenches? Good, 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 good question. If I, I, you could do a complete presentation just on the armored cars, it's such a weird story. Uh, what happens is the, the day before they rehearse, basically those armored cars have almost no potential to come off road on there. So the decision is taken to take, send them straight down the Roman road. Uh, risky, but it works. The problem is that we shell the back end of the Roman road to the northeast of Bayonvilliers, which means the trees come down on it. So to get around that, what they do is they allocate them three Mark Fives from the training school. They pre-train them the day before. So they actually rehearse pulling the armored cars across. And the, the three tanks are carrying artillery bridges, small bridges designed specifically just in case you get a small obstacle, which you could pull a gun over, which you get an armored car over. And that works very well. The armored car crews are issued with axes and ropes to assist them in taking away small branches. And they've rehearsed all that the day before. So there were no trenches then that they were crossing? There were no trenches. And for some reason, which I don't understand, the Germans make no attempt to, if, if this was us, we'd blow yeah. craters in the road, right? And we'd mine the road. And you might have spotted, mm -hmm. they did actually have some mines already at this stage, not many, but a few, but there's no attempt to do any of that. Mm. Uh, effectively, the Germans leave the road open, I think because of the assumption that they were going to do another attack. So therefore they didn't wish to block their own road. Mm. Thank you. Thanks, thanks for your question there, Michael. That's tremendous. Uh, Linda Wedderburn, Linda, do you want to unmute yourself there? Hi, this is, um, can you hear me? Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. this is actually my son's uh, Douglas, it's his question. Hello. Um, so my question is um, really what options ordinary infantrymen would have to knock out the tanks? Because obviously they'd be proof against pistol and rifle calibers and um, good, good. large large caliber machine guns didn't really exist as we know them today. So how prevalent were anti-tank rifles and how good, effective were they? Good, good question. There, there are... By this stage, there are some 13 millimeter anti-tank rifles. The Germans had put out an enormous contract, about, I think it's about 13,000 anti-tank rifles they'd ordered at speed. The problem is that these are 13 millimeter anti-tank rifles, similar to the British boys anti-tank gun of the Second World War rifle. And that has the kick of a mule, a man my weight, would literally be flung backwards by the recoil on there. And even a big man, if you didn't have your shoulder in properly, it would take your shoulder off on there. So it would appear that even the Germans didn't often use these anti-tank rifles. They are used, they're first spotted at Hamel on there. The other thing you could do was you could take five hand grenades, unscrew the ends and assemble them into a single hand grenade. This obviously is extremely dangerous for the bloke carrying all this lot, but it has just enough explosive charge so that if you put it next door to the weakest point on a First World War tank, you will blow a hole in it. And the tank or actually ran trials to prove this, but you've got to physically touch the tank. The only example I know of a tank being knocked out, and it's well illustrated in the Osprey book about Amia, is uh, is because that tank has a breakdown and therefore the infantry can get at it relatively easily. Most tanks that are knocked out are knocked out with 77 millimeters, some by 105s. A German anti-armor um, bullet, which existed before tanks because they were used to take shields out, armored shields out, won't penetrate a Mark V because the Mark V has been up armoured generally to somewhere the order of 16 millimetres of armour. That is not enough armour to keep out a 77 millimetre. 
the Germans tried to armour the A7V so it could keep out basically a British six-pounder, which can penetrate 30 millimetres at about 500 metres. Unfortunately, we were too clever for them and we hit the side of the A7V, which is probably why we penetrated the arm. So the answer, uh, anti-tank defences are pretty immature, but a good German 77 millimetre battery will cause a lot of problems. Right, thank you. So, but thanks, thanks for your question there. Uh, Richard Crompton. Richard, do you want to mute yourself there? Richard, you're now live. Yeah, thank you. A new perspective on an area I know well. Thank you very much. I've always been intrigued by the armoured car unit that captured the plans of the Hindenburg line. What was Rawlings unit? You may have mentioned it and I missed it. And do you know whether the plans are available in the company's war diary at the National Archives? Um. Uh, first, uh, well, firstly, it's it's 17th Armoured Car Battalion. 17th Armoured Car Battalion is technically 17th Tank Battalion, brackets, armoured car, close brackets. The reason is that it starts off as a, as a tank battalion being formed, then in the panic in April 1918, it's given these armoured cars that literally had almost fallen off the back of a lorry. They were intended to go to Russia, because of the first Russian revolution, they were embargoed at Austin. They were then due to all be sent to Iraq. There was a perfectly logical reason for doing that. The British armored car crews who'd been in Russia had for some reason been sent to Iraq and they're going to be used to for, assist a force called Dunkster Force, which ends up in Azerbaijan. Yeah, it's a story you just couldn't invent, is it? 16 of the armoured cars are at Bristol docks when somebody says, blink it out, we better send these to the Western Front. They're embargoed, sent back to Bulford, given to 17th Armed Tank Battalion, who are told to get on with it. The commanding officer says, I'd like some time to train my blokes, please. He gets, I think, a week to do it, and they're then deployed on there. So th those armoured cars, as for the documentation, uh, the Tank Museum has some. I don't know what happened to the Hindenburg ma maps. If you look at the um, overprinted versions of British First World War mapping for September 1918, you see a lot of detail which must have come off Rowling's detail because I'm sure you're aware we were able to churn out overprinted maps in less than a week. And I have to say, speaking from experience, that takes quite some doing, but they were capable of doing this. So they clearly turned around Rowling's map and overprinted maps for issue to, to people like tank crews, for example, when they assault the Hindenburg line on there, which meant they knew where every bunker was, for example, on there. Uh, and if you go, if you go to the um, tank museum and you go to um, uh, B, uh, second battalion's box, you actually find the range card for um, uh, six stroke 58 batteries and so like on there. Uh, on there, so there is document quite a lot of documentation about 17th tank battalion, including Rowling's report. I have to say, a uh, Carter, who was the commanding officer, left particularly good reports. I look forward to being able to go to the National Archives and look them up. Thank you very much. Uh, you need to go. I would recommend going to the Tank Museum. Tank, not Tank Museum first. Yeah, I'd go to the Tank Museum first. They're, Thank they're, you. They, they've got more personal documents than the National Archive. Great. Thank you. Thanks for your question there. Thanks very much. Uh, Matt Prolo, uh, I'm sorry I'm, I'm mispronouncing your name yet again. <laughs> That's okay, David. It's Peru. Anyways, thank you very much, sir, for the uh, presentation. Very informative. Uh, being a Canadian, a little bit of pride there hearing you talk about the, uh, the Canadian Corps. My question was about the development of tanks as an APC, and is the doctrine for armored personnel carriers starting to develop at this point, or is there any evidence or lack thereof? A really good question, because on the 8th of August 1944, uh, a Canadian Corps goes into action and op totalize, and it's no coincidence they go into action on the 8th of August, and they have 
what are true APCs, in my view, which are kangaroos. And clearly, the, uh, Austra uh, the Canadian Corps commander, who was Simpson, had clearly looked back at what had happened in the First World War on that. The Mark V stars, which I talked about in 1st and, and um, 15th Battalion, are an uncomfortable compromise, in my view, because the problem is they're length and Mark Vs. They have space at the back so they can carry extra men. But actually, the real reason why they're made longer is in order to cross longer trenches. And it doesn't work because the length is too great relative to its width and it becomes almost impossible to steer them on that. They had been an intention to create special infantry carrying companies, which were what becomes the supply tank companies uh, in 1918 on there. They're originally called infantry carrying companies or words that effect, but that was never really put into action. So I think it's clear that the concept of infantry carrying tanks is there in 1918, but it's never quite properly implemented on there. It's clear that Simpson in 1944 looked straight back at the 8th of August 1918, learned the lessons of what that told him and came up with these rather curious converted turretless tanks or turretless uh, a gunless artillery piece, tracked artillery pieces, which he then uses for his night breakthrough at Op Totalize, a really interesting action, but nothing to do with the First World War. Great. Thank you, sir. Thanks. Thanks very much, Mark. Um, Alan Wood, if you want to unmute yourself there. Hi, Geoffrey. Long time no see since our days in the Dorset Yeomanry. And, and, a day, and of course, a day without tanks is a day wasted, as we well know. So. My question is really is um, having been a Hamal many times, how important do you think the work was the work of Monash to re-establish the trust in the tank corps with the Australians after their much, much publicized, I'm not going to call it disaster, but setbacks with the tanks at Bullcore in oh, April, uh, April May 1917? Yeah, yeah. Sorry, Bullcore is a complete cock up. Uh, everything goes wrong, it shouldn't have happened, the tanks arrive late, the plan is poorly thought out. The only thing you can say in defence, really, I think, of the tanks is that the crews were remarkably brave, and I disagree. There's an Australian VC who's incredibly rude about the tank crews, and he's quite wrong. Uh, the tank crews were very brave. The key bit is that the lessons were learnt from that on there, um, and I think yeah, it's an interesting question to address on there. Uh, on there, um, I think probably remind me of the second part of your question. Sorry, I've... You know, how how important was was Monash really in you know, what's Sorry. his role in this? Because it's much much it's much what's the I word? Actually, by Australians about uh, how he learned all the time. I actually think the key person here is Rawlinson. Right, Rawlinson, who was known as the Fox, because he was slightly devious. Rawlinson writes a paper where he says, we need to have as many possible other means than infantrymen to win the war. That included tanks, more Lewis guns, etc. He gets Monash as Monash is coming in. So Monash is a newly promoted divisional commander. And basically, he imposes on Monash, in my view, the Hamelm attack. It's Monash who manages the attack superbly, as you would expect on there. But it's Rawlinson. And I, it can't be a coincidence that it's the Australian division that was at Bullocor that's at Hamel. That can't be a coincidence on there. And noticeably, they still had some reservations because the tanks are not allowed to lead at the beginning of the attack. And Bingham, who is the tank corps commander of the tanks, issues an explicit instruction, which must have been against orders, where he says to the tanks, the first thing you are to do is to get in front of the Australian infantry as quickly as possible. At Amya, the Australians, by the, by the time Hamal is over, all the friction between the tank corps and the 
Australians has gone. In fact, there's a lovely piece in the 13th Tank Battalion's history where they say, quote, Australian soldiers were even seen to salute Tank Corps officers. Right, and looting was not one of the strong points of Australian infantry on there. And the relationship between 5th Tank Brigade and um, the Australians was particularly strong right till the end. The last action fought by the Australians at Morbrill is almost a peon to tank infantry cooperation. There's a lovely piece in, the, in, in uh, Bean's massively long history where he describes the final attack with... Australian officers and tank corps officers cooperating directly to get the tanks in the right place. So I think Monash is important in terms of organising the battle. My personal view is it's Rawlinson that's key because it's Rawlinson who realised, A, he needed to retrial Cambrai in a small scale and B, he needed to give the Australians confidence in the tanks, particularly in the Mark Fives. Of course, the Mark Fives are much, much better tanks in many ways for the attack than the Mark Fours are, and that succeeds brilliantly. Thank you. Thanks very much for that. Thanks for your question, Alan. Yeah. Um, right, uh, next, Mark Armstrong. Mark, do you want to just unmute yourself there? Um, thank you, David, and uh, th thank you, Geoffrey. Um, as a uh, late Remy officer and having been EMI of an armoured infantry battalion, you won't be surprised by my question, which is really about um, how good were we um, in those days at cannibalisation and uh, repairing the, the tanks and getting them back into the battle? That, that's a really good question, because um, we had a, the basic problem we had in the First World War is a shortage of expert maintainers. And the terminology becomes very confusing on that. There is no equivalent for Remy. The Remy don't come into existence till 42 from memory on that. October there. 42. But, but, yeah, the maintainer crews are actually tank call crews uh, on that. The problem is that there is a dearth of and the reason is obvious, there are relatively few motor vehicles in civilian life, and therefore the number of people who know how to do maintenance is very restricted, and therefore there is a massive competition between the factories, who are using basically the same type of bloke, the central workshops, which is based in the tank core administrative area, which needs large numbers of people to refurbish tanks as they come back and as they come in, because they had the same problem as I recall having with initially we had with uh, the arrival of new tanks, which are new tanks need inspecting and checking because you can't always check the manufacturer's done exactly what he says he's got done on there. And they have a really major problem about the availability of expert um, personnel. Their solution is to withdraw most of the expert personnel back into a central workshops. The problem about that is that they then leave the crews responsible for doing what we would call repair, i.e. changing things like engines. Well, you will not be surprised to learn that it didn't work, despite the fact that when you read the tank corps official records, they tell you it did work. But if you read very carefully the after action reports, you find it didn't work in practice. And in practice, what they end up doing right at the end of the First World War is effectively ending up going back to a system that looks a bit like the one, the one we had in the Cold War, i.e. a light aid detachment, sections within each company, which is what they had, funnily enough, in 1916. Right? So we, it's the usual business. You go around a little circle, don't you? Right? On that, because quite reasonably, they say at the end of the First World War in the debriefs they wrote, they say you can't expect tank crews to both do maintenance and do repair. It's made even worse with a First World War tank because there's a major problem of carbon monoxide poisoning and heat inside both the Mark V in particular, but also with the Whippet, which means that crews finish the first day of most actions utterly exhausted. They're not in a position to do any significant repair on that. So it's interesting that all the things that you and me knew, it's all the same stuff, frankly, on there. 
in the end, you need embedded ma maintenance crews available at first line. And you need, by, by 1918, the crews are very well trained. I will give them that. They can do the repairs, interestingly. Their problem is really exhaustion after the first actions. The other problem is we don't produce enough tanks. So there aren't enough replacement tanks. So the only way we can have replacement tanks is to send them back to central workshops, repair them and send them back out again. The problem is central workshops has to process them very quickly. So sometimes the tanks coming back are not in very good nick. Again, that sounds vaguely familiar, doesn't it? it the massive pressure that you put repair organizations under, sometimes it's just too much even for the repair organizations on there. So, plus ça change. Thank you, Geoffrey. The only thing worse than getting the tank crews to maintain them is to get the infantry to do it. So uh, I'm not available for comment. <laughs> OK, th th thanks for your question there, Mark. Thank you. Um, Robin Atwood, Robin, do you want to unmute yourself there? Thank you very much. Um, as a former RTR officer, I greatly enjoyed your talk. But um, I've always understood that the artillery, the rolling barrage, is the key. And also that um, at the onset before Amiens, they had ranged on the German gun positions. And so over 500 of the German gun positions had been found. And as soon as the barrage started, the fire fell on the vast majority of German gun positions. The German gunners didn't even come out of the bunkers. They knew they'd be killed if they did. Um, but your talk clearly calls that into question because a lot of tanks are knocked out by German gunners. I wonder if you can reconcile the two. Please. Yeah. Um, uh, you're, uh, you're, you're, firstly, I be, you're absolutely correct. The, the, if you're going to win the First World War, the key is artillery. Um, that goes without saying. The problem that they faced at both Amiens and at Cambrai is that if you're going to advance the distance they advanced at Amiens, you're beyond field artillery range. Uh, and that meant at some moment, the tanks were going to have to take over the advance. Uh, there was a German officer who was asked, you know, um, how do you win the war? He said, well, if you use artillery, tanks and infantry, you will win three times out of four. If you use artillery and infantry, you will you win most of the time, about half the time. If you use just tanks and infantry, you might win a quarter of the time on there, which is slightly unkind, but probably about right. The answer is that even at Calmery, the, 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 the counter battery appears to have neutralized the guns, but not knocked them out. And again, that's a familiar cry. Destruction is very difficult with artillery. Neutralization, i.e. keeping their heads down, that's perfectly feasible. And it looks as though what happens to those German artillery batteries, one of the three German guns of 658 is knocked out by artillery. But the other two, they're dug in, the crews have taken refuge. They wait because they know what we're going to do. They know there's going to be a rolling barrage. They wait for the rolling barrage to lift. And you've noticed as soon as the rolling barrage lifts, the guns are out because the star major has been waiting. And he had, I reckon he waited two hours for that lift, right? Because the, the first artillery goes down at 420, sorry, four hours. The first German art, first artillery goes down at 420, which is when the advance starts. They don't cross for the second phase until 820. So that Sergeant Major must have been sitting there waiting, literally, to say, oi, out go the guns. But the answer is clearly, in some cases, they didn't knock the guns out. All they did was to keep their heads down. And of course, as soon as the counter battery stops, the, the German guns know that they've got to poke their heads out. Right, because you're got, you're not going to use heavy artillery on German guns when you've got advancing troops nearby because of this because of the shell template on there. So I think the answer is they simply failed to take those batteries out. They're too well dug in. Well, thank you very much. That's a very very clear answer, as one would expect from a tank regiment officer. Thank, thank you. you thank you. A very clear question. <laughs> Thanks, Rodney. Thanks very much for your question there. 
Mike Phipps. Michael, uh, you want to unmute yourself there? Thanks, David. Jeffrey, brilliant presentation, tremendous knowledge. Um, <clears throat> I was uh, interested to know whether or not the uh, training and the briefing given to the tank commanders of the Whippet tanks was significantly different to the commanders of the Mark Fives and, and recognising their sort of different attributes and and was the musical box uh, used as a, uh, a, a evidence of what they could potentially do or was that just somebody in particular being very creative? Yeah, yeah, um, yeah you, it's a very good question. Firstly, the level of training is absolutely critical to the success of the operation. So you probably picked up, one of the problems three Corps has is they've had little or no time to train with the tanks. The Australians have trained extensively with the tanks. The Canadians who are very high quality infantry, they've suffered very few casualties. They have done some training with the tanks. There is not much evidence that the cavalry and the whippets train together despite the fact that the hierarchy of the Whippet battalions had been changed for cavalrymen. So the hierarchies of the battalions consisted almost entirely of cavalrymen, down to section and sometimes individual vehicle commanders on there. So there was a conscious effort to make them effectively be as near to cavalry units as they could manage on there but they don't appear to have trained significantly with the cavalry for reasons that are not completely clear. It's nothing to do with the, uh, the, the atmosphere in, during the interwar period, because as I say, most of them were cavalrymen working together on there. I think it's just one of those fogs of war problem, uh, to be honest, on there. The other problem was that the whippets and the cavalry didn't really have properly complementary skills the cavalry could get through some ground, the whippets couldn't. But the whippet, of course, whenever you hit a machine gun, the whippet could deal with that comfortably. The cavalry found it much more difficult to deal with it on there. On there. And if you contrast the armoured car's performance to the whippet's performance, there is no comparison, except for musical box. Mm. A musical box is the exception, I think, that proves the rule. But actually, I'd suggest, look at the armoured cars for what they might have been able to do. Fuller had suggested that all the whippets should have been concentrated into one group and used to cut off the Germans behind the French. Not completely daft, actually, that, so do a great big loop on there. And in my view, the problem was they should have just operated the cavalry and the whippets separately. They weren't really suitable to operate together, and they'd have been better using the whippets en masse to try and achieve some effect. Uh, and later on, whippets get wasted, frankly, acting as substitutes for, for, me, for heavy tanks, which they're not very good substitutes for heavy tanks. I mean, they do the job, uh, but they're not as well armed as the heavy tanks. So to answer your question, I think the whippets are a bit of a lost opportunity and the armoured cars give you a better idea of what could have been achieved. And remember, the whippets have got quite reasonable cross-country capability. Yeah. And eight miles an hour, is the speed at which cavalry can move at the trot, according to the 1914 manual. Right, so in other words, that's a sustained maximum speed for cavalry, basically. Gallop would be 15, to be precise, according to the 1914 manual on that. Good question, thank you very much. Thanks, Thanks. Michael. Ian, I'm gonna ask you to unmute yourself. Clive, you've been hanging out a long time, but Clive, I'm gonna ask you, to come in last with your question because uh, it's a good final question. So uh, forgive me, Clive, I know you've been hanging around a long time. Ian, just unmute yourself, please. Ah, hopefully that's worked. Yeah. You, um, you thanks, are. David, uh, and thanks, Jeffrey. That was fascinating. Um, I was interested in what you were saying in terms of what they were up against, in particular those six artillery batteries, uh, including six, 658 from memory that you were just talking about. Yeah. And the others, which I think were from FAR 74, am I right in uh, saying it? Was 74? 79 and 29. 79 Sorry. and 27 off the top of my head. Um, yeah, I, was, I was trying to picture what the, the number was on the, yeah. on, the, on the map. And particularly when, against 658, when they were advancing across that quite open field. 
So what what were they up against? Were those 77 field guns, 105s or well, what? In theory, and I, in theory, they should have all been 77 millimeter field guns. However, there is a picture of a 105 millimeter on there, which suggests that they might have issued some 105s to 77 millimeter batteries. I, I'm the the numbering tells you that they should be 77 millimeter on there. Uh, if I remember correctly, if you're low in the battery numbering, those are 77 millimeter batteries. If you're high in the battery number, numberings, eights, nines, I think, and sevens, eights, and nines, they should be 105s. So in theory, they should have all been 77 millimeter, but there's a picture of a 105 gun knocked out next door to a B company tank, commanded by a man called Samuels, which was also knocked out. And there's an excellent description by the company commander of actually coming on to uh, where that where they're knocked out. So to answer your question, in theory, they should all have been 77 millimeter. We know there was at least one of one, 105 millimeter uh, there. Uh, these are all field batteries. There's no heavy artillery. There was some heavy artillery, 5.5 inch, as we call them, uh, further south. And there's at least one gun that's captured by a C Company tank further south on there. Uh, on there, and the gun lines are overrun. I mean, that's part of the problem. And to preempt another question, the reason why they've reinforced 41st Division with more artillery. So there are more artillery batteries than just the organic 41st Division batteries, which, which makes sense. It's the Roman road, you know. The odd thing is the Germans don't appear to have had a gun actually pointing down the Roman road which I find absolutely extraordinary, right? But it's the kind of cock up that one tends to assume only the British would do. And clearly the Germans in this case did the same thing. You know, The first thing you do is to say, have you got one gun pointing down that road? You know, it's almost instinctive. I don't, they clearly didn't. There's one anti-aircraft gun a bit further on it and he misses basically uh, on there. And then he scarpers, I think, uh, sensibly. Uh, on that, so uh, so no, they should have all been seventy sevens, but there's at least one one hundred five for reasons that I'm not clear. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thanks, you. Um, James Hayday. James, you should unmute yourself. James, I don't oh. think you've got any video capability there. So uh, no, I haven't actually. No, no worries. It doesn't matter. Just ask your question. That's fine. Uh, yeah, basically, I just want to know what the um, how the RAF supported the tank corps during the battle. Good. A, sorry, thank you very much. I didn't talk about air because there's not enough space and I was concentrating on tanks. Uh, there was a complete squadron, 8th squadron, commanded by Lee Mallory, and it's the same Lee Mallory as in big flights in 1940 on there. Uh, and it was a conscious experiment to try and give the tank corps its own ability to pick up targets. And after one of the was that there was a need for uh, effectively a fighter ground attack capability and another squadron is put in in order to be able to identify a gun. There's no significant air support. I think it's not until about nine o'clock when the mist properly clears on there. And one of the tasks that eight squadron had been given was to drop smoke, which is one of the reasons why they didn't use smoke extensively on there. At Cambrai, they use a lot of smoke screens. Um, they and they drop um, smoke pots, and it's this, this is in the planning for there. They do it by the end of the battle. They're doing quite a lot of what I call fighter ground attack. And one of the striking things of later on in the hundred days is that you get vast amounts of aircraft doing something that feels very much like the Second World War. You know, cab there's stuff almost like cab ranking in the Second World War picking up opportunity targets, marking targets, tanks will mark targets for aircraft at the end of the 100 days. You get stuff that looks like the Second World War. It's a really interesting field. And there are some interesting reports written by Lee Mallory, um, which were taken up for the Second World War, albeit, I have to say, not till 43, 44 on there, uh, on there, 
uh, because the RAF took terrible casualties on fighter ground attack, particularly during the uh, March retreat. Uh, and I think it probably put them off doing fighter ground attack at the beginning of the Second World War. But to answer your question, there's quite a lot of experimentation and that's taken forward after Amia because everybody's conscious that one of the things aircraft can do is to pick up anti-tank guns. Okay, thanks Great. very much. Thanks, Thank you. Thanks for your question there, James. So, Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Clive, uh, I've deliberately held your question back because it's a good summary question, I think, for, for the uh, entire talk. So, uh, Clive, just to uh, fire away with your, your, your question there. Uh, Jeffrey, thank you very much indeed for a brilliant talk. Um, I think we last met almost 40 years ago, actually, on JDSC, which was an interesting, uh, <laughs> interesting time. <laughs> if I may, just before asking my question, could I just pick up on Mark Armstrong and his question about sort of maintenance? My understanding is that in the very early days of the tank corps, um, you actually drew in mechanical transport support from the Army Service Corps. And uh, some of whom were then, I believe, rebadged Tank Corps to provide, I suppose, a degree of first and second line um, uh, sort of mechanical engineering support. Is that yeah, something? That, that's completely correct. 711 Motor Transport Company provided quite a lot of expert personnel who effectively transferred straight across. It wasn't called a Tank Corps at that time. It was like, well, the heavy heavy section of the machine gun corps, they transfer straight across either just before or just after Fleur's Courcelette. Uh, and they are the central core of the maintenance capability, as we now call it, uh, at the beginning of the whole process. Mm. Thank you. Now, my question was whether or not the lessons learned from Amiens, despite this late stage in the war, were actually drawn into all arms or indeed uh, sort of tank core doctrine, um, or, or whether were these lessons like so often uh, sort of just lost in the mist of time? No, they appear, they appear to be fuller in his memoirs, which are not necessarily always completely reliable, but in this case, I think they probably are, says that every time an action took place, he would read through all the reports and try and extract what he thought was of relevance. The reports are copious and detailed and very good, and they almost always include lessons learned. And at the end of the First World War, somebody, probably Fuller, issued a template to to tell every brigade and every battalion, not only to produce their own battalion history, but also to produce a battle experience doctrine, which we call a sort of massive after action report, which goes through absolutely everything. I've got the three group one, and it's about 200 bloody pages oh. right, of detailed stuff, really good stuff. Well, now that's, a, that's the reason why I know the repair system didn't work perfectly because it actually comments that the system didn't work on there. So it looks as though, in the case of the tank corps, I talked about the air bit. Lee Mallory writes a detailed report. That report is then taken forward, and they change the nature of the air support for the next major attacks that go in. So when they do the breaching of the Drucul Quayon line, the air support has changed quite a lot, is much more efficient at picking up targets, for example, and marking them with smoke. And the tank crews know what to look for by that stage on there. So I think to answer your question, it's not perfect, but it's not bad. The report are clearly read. Every report tends to have recommendations on what they what should change. And you do see some change take place. For example, uh, you find smoke rounds appearing right at the end of the First World War, which was clearly a development that somebody said, right, we need to have a smoke round here. Uh, you find a way of producing smoke off the exhaust. That comes on there. Improvements in camouflage, things like that. So to answer your question, yes. 
And the striking thing is these reports written just after the end of the First World War, which are very detailed after action reports written, I suspect, by every single brigade, not all that have survived, every single brigade and uh, battalion. And I have to say, sometimes I curse them because there's so much material. I mean, it, you, you could have 10 people reading this stuff and I don't think you'd ever manage to read the whole lot on there. It's, it's, it's quite impressive on there and they're, and they're conscious of what they're doing. They know they're pioneers. Thank you. Uh, to answer your question. Despite, despite the fact that by the early 30s, we came within a hair's breadth of disbanding the tank corps. Yes, it's, it's, an in, it's an interesting question. We're not the only people who lose the plot. The French <laughs> lose the plot as well on there. And of course, the sad thing is the people who really do learn the lessons from this are the Germans, obviously, are on there. Um, yeah, I mean, to answer, to answer your question, of course, there was a degree of forgetting. But interestingly, um, first tank brigade, the, the one that does the experiments under Hubbard, actually does a battlefield tour, which takes in Cambrai, and I think took in Amiens as well. Right. on that. It's quite a detailed Amiens battlefield tour, which is a really interesting battlefield tour because there's people who actually fought at Amiens talking about what they did. So you can take forward the lessons learned. Most of them are taken forward in terms of looking at the equipment and the priority on communications right. and things like damp suspension, for example, which allow you to drive significantly faster. Those are taken forward. But yeah, inevitably, you lose something in peacetime, don't you? Yeah, thank uh, you. Sadly. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for your question there, Clive. Right. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, that is half past nine. So um, by uh, my reckoning, that's um, that's a good time to be uh, to be finishing. So, uh, Geoffrey, that, that's been absolutely tremendous. We've had a really excellent evening. Um, and the, if I like to... Uh, if I can say the quality of questions was was absolutely superb, which just added to the added yeah. to the enjoyment of of, of the presentation. Um, so, if everybody would like to once again raise their hands in the virtual Zoom world as a as a round of applause, um, as a as a final thank you to Jeffrey, and I can confirm once again we're getting hundreds of hands being raised as a as a round as a virtual round of applause here um, I, I, I leave, all it leaves me to say is uh, we go again next week um, with uh, Professor Gary Sheffield who's talking about John Terrain and reassessing his um, contribution to, to uh, revisionist history of the First World War so that will be another um, excellent um, presentation next Monday um, and uh, all I'd say as well Jeffrey to you is sincere thanks for your time and for the effort you've put into that presentation, which was um, thoroughly enjoyable. Um, and um, ladies and gentlemen, I'll see everybody hopefully next next Monday. Thanks very much. Mademoiselle.